So our next talk is going to be uh, taking BDSM out of PCI to BDSS uh, through open source solutions. Please give an applause for Zach and Eric. <laughs> is what you get today. Just be very happy you guys are far away from us. So welcome. Our talk is taking the BDSM out of PCI. We're trying to put a fun spin on PCI, which as you all might know is challenging at best. So who are we? Who are these schmucks that came to Brew kind of talk about PCI? I'm Erin Jacobs. I'm a partner in our bank security. I've been doing PCI since 2007 with various consultancies and also internal as a CSO at a financial institution. I've been around the block with it. I know the pains from being an internal implementer as well as being a consultant trying to apply these controls to some very unique environments, starting from small business, scaling all the way up to enterprise with millions of users. Oh, it's quite right. whoa. Good afternoon. I'm Zach Faisal. Uh, I am also a partner at Urbane Security. And I've been a little bit more on the offensive security side and defensive security side. So we kind of bring this duality of the security person and the compliance person trying to get together and actually you know, make sense of what the letter of the law is. So a lot of people ask us every time we give a talk, what are your qualifications? What makes you the one who can give this talk? Well, those are our qualifications. We intentionally leave it blank. Our philosophy is always question, always challenge. No matter whoever's speaking, double check what they're saying, and we want you to do the same for us. So if you guys have any questions, by all means, please ask them. Please challenge us if you think we say something wrong, and we'll do our best to say, yeah. So, all right, Aaron? We'll do our best to say, we'll see. So as an overview, what this talk is going to be about, we're, we're not going to limit on PCI. We're going to do a very quick overview of PCI. We're going to talk about open source versus free versus commercial solutions. We're going to address the most common areas of the PCI control deficiencies that we've seen in most organizations, again, scaling all the way from a small to mid-sized business to enterprise organizations. We're seeing the same across the board. We're going to talk about how we're going to leverage these controls to actually improve overall security. And I know that's something that everyone just cringes at is because PCI is not a security framework. It's a framework to protect our holder data. We're also going to try to give you guys a few of our compliance strategies and, and quick wins, easy things to do to make your life a whole lot easier if you're on the internal side dealing with a QSA or uh, SAQ. And then we'll do some questions and answers. What this talk absolutely is not is every PCI gotcha that there is. We are not going to give you random battle stories from the field. We'll probably use a few examples, but we're going to limit it as much as possible. And the one thing we're absolutely not going to do is we're not going to bash PCI, we're not going to praise it, and we're not going to stand here and try to call for any types of change in the standard. That's for a whole different form, and that's not what we're here to do. PCI is what it is. It is what it is. So because we're QSAs coming out and saying a lot of things about how to implement PCI in your environments or the environments you may deal with, uh, we kind of have to put this disclaimer up quick. Um, so with all PCI, your mileage may vary. Everything's unique to your environment. And what we say may not be what your dealings with PCI may be because your assessor may not understand what you're doing. Depends on who you deal with, but we wanted to put that out there. So if you have someone and you go back and say, oh, this, this is what they said, they may not understand what it actually works. Also, it's our opinions and our guidance. This in no way is endorsed by the PCI Council in any way, shape, or form, or any other QSAs. However, unlike a lot of people's Twitter's account, these do represent our opinions and views. So our legal uh, consultant, Sir Barks a lot, made us put this in here and we felt the need to uh, disclose that right away. Yes, again, in regards to being a QSA, we do, from Urbane Security, we do endorse what we're stating, and one of the items that Zach did address is that your mileage will vary depending on what QSA you get and what QSA firm you get. So, uh, 2004 called and they wanted their talk back. 
2008 emailed us and they wanted their talk back. And uh, 2010 texted, which I'm not sure why, because it seems like they would have had that in 2004, but they wanted their talk back too. The point of this is that it, none of this is new. But the problem we're having is that we're not seeing that anyone's talking about it. We're not talking about actual solutions to ease the problems that and we're seeing with PCI. It's not just a PCI-relevant issue either. Two of the main challenges we have with PCI is cost and difficulty to implement. And additionally, more and more have to comply with PCI, whether it's in the States, in Europe, everywhere around has to do their uh, getting back in hang on. I was going to add on to that. One of the big things is more and more you'll find these weird people saying you have to comply by PCI. Well, we don't have our cardholder data. Well, our contract says you have to do PCI. We've seen this over and over again becoming more of a standardized thing for large companies to use this as a baseline. I don't know why. And it's the hardest thing to define, but it's something that, you know, if you're in information security, you're going to come across, whether it's for your organization or for an organization down the line. Right, that's very true. Vendors are pushing it down no matter if there's cardholder data or not. So again, what is PCI? Currently, we're in the PCI, the payment card holder, or the payment card industry data security standard version 2.0. Version, version 3.0 is coming up, and we have a whole lot of fun little uh, acronyms for what we want to call PCI, but since this is not endorsed by the PCI Council, we obviously cannot say Barks a lot told us that we can't have their logo up. So again, this is our reminder that this isn't endorsed by the council or any other QSAs. Fearful right now who just came in. This is for you, Martin. So haters are gonna hate PCI. So why do we hate it so much? We hate it because it's complicated. We hate it because it's an agony to try to comply with. And you know what? It's not just internal. Our QSAs generally hate it too for those same reasons. PCI cannot be ignored, usually. It single-handedly can destroy and obliterate entire IT and security budgets, depending on what tools you utilize. And a lot of organizations, very sadly, have had absolutely horrible experience with inexperienced QSAs, QSAs that don't have the technical competency to actually evaluate the controls and understand what they're looking at when they're looking and interacting with some of the network teams in a lot of organizations. So this is where I'm gonna fly through this pretty quick, and if you have any questions, by all means, at the end, ask. So we're gonna talk a little bit about actual PCI very fast. So let's talk about scope, and let's talk about what PCI is. So this all comes from the PCI Standards Council. PCI was created jointly in 2004. It's the widely accepted policy and procedures intended to optimize the security of credit, debit, and cash card transactions and protect cardholder data. So, I just noticed you put the drink in there, by the way. We forgot to tell everyone to get drinks, but since you can't have them here, I very much apologize. There are four general levels of PCI compliance. The one that we see most often is level one, which is the level that's gonna require you to have a QSA come on site. Levels two, three, and four are gonna require the, the SAQ, the, the self-assessment questionnaires to be completed. Uh, and they have the different tiers in there. Again, if you want more information, our slides will be available and you can go into it. So, for the purposes of this talk and let the drinking game begin, if we actually had beer in here, we're going to define cardholder data. The primary cardholder data is your, the cardholder name, expiration, service code, sensitive authentication data, the full mag strip, the CVV code, card verification data, and PIN number. The sense of authentication data cannot be stored at any, any given time, and this will come into play in just a few moments. So PCI has to do with any system that stores, processes, transmits, manages, or is directly connected to cardholder data environments. So that pretty much could put everything in scope, but we're not going to sit here and talk about how everything is in scope. We're going to talk about how we can try to simplify it. Most organizations' goals is to try to limit the scope of the systems. We try to apply the security check, I'm sorry, controls when doing PCI. <laughs> and obviously, any organization that goes through a level one assessment, the end game is to actually pass and end up with your report of compliance and attestation of compliance. So in regards to uh, limiting the scope, we have a lot of things to consider. 
one of the most common things we hear and we hear from a lot of vendors is to basically make it somebody else's problem, outsource it, let's tokenize it, let's keep it out of our environment. Well, that's, that's gonna change. You're not gonna be able to, out, to completely get rid of all responsibility once PCI 3.0 comes out. What's gonna happen is that you're still gonna be responsible to ensure that whoever you're outsourcing it to is taking the responsibility and diligence with your data. So in, in whole, it's gonna turn into everyone's problem yet again. You have to get up now. It's time to fight, Zach. And I was just getting comfy. So, oh, I got the clicker too, awesome. So why are we talking about open source stuff and why not just talk about free and commercial ways to get that little checkbox? So with open source solutions, you really have a lot of flexibility with the way you're able to deploy it, as well as obviously the biggest saving is cost. You don't have to deal with dropping twenty to $30,000 a year on some solution just to get that checkbox. And really, as, as we were drilling home about the cost thing, I mean, that's one of the biggest things about going commercial. Not to say there's anything wrong with paying some money on some good solutions, but if you're a smaller organization, or even if you're a larger organization who has really intelligent people like those of you in this room, you guys can take and use some open source solutions that you can become familiar with and start deploying in the environments that you have to deal with this. As well as there's only one requirement in PCI that you can't use open source for, and that's the external vulnerability scans. With the external vulnerability scans, they have to be a paid scan from a authorized scanning vendor, ASV. That's right, anyone correct me, because I always mix it up. Wow, got it right, hopefully. So, and again, like I was saying, it provides greater flexibility and growth. With you having the control of the source code as well as ability to write custom additions to it, you really can modify it for your environment instead of it being a rigid thing that doesn't work for you. And you're not locked into then a specific vendor implementation. Down the line, you know, in a year or two, you realize that your needs have changed. You're not stuck in a contract with someone. But open source isn't always the right choice. Sometimes you need it just to work. Sometimes you need someone you can point at and say, this isn't working, I'm paying you money, fix it. So really, what we're pushing for is more people who have the money to spend on resources, intelligent people on their team, over buying some product and just sending it all off to the larger corporations. So time and time again, we see a lot of issues with organizations trying to adhere PCI. Really, there's been talks about how do you beat PCI compliance, and the thing is they don't provide any clear guidelines on how to configure your environment because, as they always say, it depends. Your mileage may vary. Your environment may be different. And they speak really theoretically. You should implement log controls. Yeah, and it's up to your QSA's opinion. And they talk that they're very theoretically, instead of actually, here's how you do it. Here's how you can do this and meet the requirement and go even above and beyond and improve your security even more. A lot of them talked about freemium solutions too, where it's free for the first 10, but once you got that taste, it's gonna cost you. And they always focus on either one or another operating system. Either it's focused only on Windows, focused only on Linux, who focuses on Mac, I don't know, but they always focus on only one operating system. So we decided we wanted to change this. We wanted to really believe, or we believe in the sharing of information and knowledge and really growing the resources we have without having to throw all our money at our vendor. Again, nothing wrong with it, but sometimes when you're a smaller organization, you wanna do that. So we decided to start something called the Open PCI Project. I don't recommend scanning QR codes, but there's a quick link, go ahead. <laughs> so openpciproject.com, or it's also on our website, um, urbanesecurity.com. By the way, we didn't give enough background on that. We're a professional services consulting firm. We don't sell any products. We only sell advice and services. So we're not gonna try to pimp some product we have a vested interest in. We're vendor agnostic. But so openpciproject.com, that's kind of a lame domain name. <laughs> The problem is, is that all the other open PCI ones were taken, and we couldn't really come up with a good one in the meantime. And I was not spending 1200 American to get a domain name. 
hate the market like that. Yeah, excuse me for one second. So, what is our goal, really? What, what are we trying to drive behind this, behind this talk, behind this open PCI project? Is we're looking to come up with not just guidelines that are cross-platform, that are tried and tested by ourselves, our clients, and your organizations, that are scalable, that actually elevate security, not just get you that checkbox, and that actually compare it to other solutions that may be in the market. But we're looking for also to put together, and are putting together, specific walkthroughs. So an IT administrator, or a security administrator, or one of you in the room who may not have experience in a certain solution, will be able to take and walk through and get something up and running, and may need to learn a little bit more about it, but enough that you'll be able to get yourself to one level, and then to the next, to the next, to the next, and continue your knowledge and growing with that. And I want to encourage you guys that if you see anything out there, and we've extensively scoured the web for absolutely anything and reached out to people to find out more information. If anybody's doing any work with any type of open source solutions, freeware solutions, or creative solutions for addressing these issues, and some of the most information we, were, we found was dated back to like 2010, and it was part one, I'm going to do this, part two never ever came. So this is one of the big issues going back to when we started the talk. This isn't new, but we're not talking about it and we're not dealing with it and it's something that causes a lot of people pain all the time. Yeah, uh, one of the big things is people don't follow through with these online guides. It'll be, I installed WordPress and I'm gonna start the HTML5 how-to guide. Five years later. So, I'm gonna put up an obligatory, another disclaimer, this is the last one in the slides. Now, that open PCI project domain, and it'll be in the slides, it'll be, you know, we'll, we'll tweet it out later with a BrewCon hashtag and all. Um, I'm really bad, if you know from me historically, about updating things. I don't know why I would ever be bad at updating things or posting things in a reasonable amount of time, but I am. So we do and will be posting more and more and more as the days come. Right now it's a placeholder page. We're giving this talk also at DerbyCon, so as soon as that's done, we're gonna be uploading everything. But we're trying to finish this everything off, so it isn't that whole, you should do this. Okay, how do I do this? How do I even get started? So, we've dealt with a lot of organizations, and what are really the top issues we see over and over and over? So these are the 12 high-level PCI requirements. Actually, just real quick, by a show of hands, how many people have dealt with PCI before in kind of their day to days? Not too many. How many people here are in like information security on the defensive side? Awesome. Off engineers, thank you. Software development, coders. Two stand alone, awesome. So these are the kind of the top issues that really are, or not the top issues, but the top 12 requirements. Not top, the only 12, my apologies. I'm tired. The 12 policies for PCI. Now, we kind of crossed out here the ones that everyone have handled. You know, they have implement firewalls. We know how to implement a firewall by now. It's 2013, everyone knows how to do firewalling. It's not hard. Your grandma has a firewall on her computer. We got that covered. Changing defaults, we know how to change passwords by now. We know it's a bad thing to leave default passwords and configurations. Protecting cardholder data using encryption shredding little paper documents, the little knuckle busters, making sure you delete stuff when you're done with it. We know how to do that by now, we know that's good. We know we have to do that, it's pretty easy, most people have it solved. What? Oh yeah, so yeah. So I mean, not to say there's not still issues out there with them, but we don't see it that much. Or when we see it, it's easily fixed. It's something that you're able to fix in an afternoon or a week. It's not something where you're like, oh, where do I even start? And I have to be compliant by tomorrow? I need to actually improve my security? I want to, but how do I do this fast? Encryption, encrypting data in transit. We know how to use SSL by now, come on. Antivirus is something we see a lot of people trying to address this, especially in high performance environments. How do you, in an environment, and we'll touch on this in a minute, address having to have antivirus when that, you know, whatever percentage impact is too much for your business to handle. Securing systems and applications, we still suck at programming. 
I don't know how to solve this other than teaching people <laughs> better, you know, and starting at the academic level, but we still suck at developing secure code. Limiting access, we know how to put passwords on things. Assigning unique IDs, we could do, but when it comes to two-factor authentication, more and more organizations, while they're still changing to it, they don't all have it in place, and where do they start for a cost-effective solution? Physical controls, we know how to put a lock on stuff. Logging is one of the biggest ones, we'll touch on that in a second. Penetration testing and scanning, again, most people still need a little work in, but you know, it's something that can get easily fixed, and I'm sorry, I didn't cross the last two out, I was supposed to cross them out, so that's a typo. Policies, most of us have policies, but we'll touch on that later too. So, what do, does everyone think is the number one problem? Everyone is very quiet. From what we've seen, it's logging. Over and over and over and over again, people aren't logging enough properly or are spending way too much money on it. So, logs, 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 logs. Log all the things. So PCI requirement number 10 talks a lot about logging and monitoring and detecting. And so a lot of organizations have no idea even where to start. And their easiest solution is, we'll buy a product for that. One of the ones that we love personally, and again, you know, nothing to say there's anything wrong with a commercial solution, is Splunk. Splunk is an amazing tool. I believe they're a sponsor here too. We love Splunk. I was waiting for a vendor to be like, yes. So we love Splunk. The thing is, it is very costly. And if you're an organization of 10, 15, 20 people, you may not have the 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 to log what you need to do properly a year. Again, don't hold me to these numbers. If there's Splunk people in the room, we love you. So there are solutions, though, to do this. And there's a lot to consider with this. Is with logging, you have to obviously generate the logs. Right? We actually have to have these events to watch. We have to actually send these logs to a central storage. We have to actually store and process these logs so we know what's going on and monitor them to make sure that if something is wrong, we're not just storing stuff on a hard drive, we know where to go. And so like I said, the biggest thing, and if people don't get the image, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. I'm not sure if that translates over here, but so what should we log? Obviously more is better, but that's not always the easiest solution. Logging more means more disk space, more processing, more licensing fees if you are going commercial. But at a minimum, PCI says, at a bare minimum you have to log, everyone's logging, success unveiled, any administrative actions performed by an admin. That includes everything not just ran as sudo, everything ran as root, Everything ran in as Windows if you're a local admin. There's a lot of things to consider and a lot of organizations go, how do I log what an admin does on a Windows box? Uh, what, what do I need to check this box? So that's one of the big things is why we're putting together this project is so it'll say these are the configurations you need to have for this and here's the group policies you can apply. Done. You also have to log the initialization and clearing of any logs and any kind of changes to system, policies, configurations, that kind of stuff. Additionally, beyond just the system logs, any kind of file integrity changes, antivirus alerts, intrusion detection alerts, those kind of things. So, excuse me for one second, I need water here. Out of curiosity, are there any QSAs or former QSAs in the room? I know at least one. All right, out of those hands, did any of you guys have absolutely zero problems with people finding the logs that they had? All right. Because that tends to be one of the larger, more fun, you know, little activities for a QSA, at least in my book, is when you sit with a client and you go, okay, well, you have these logs, great. Show me them. And they sit there with a Splunk query and they're like, it should be there, and it never is. So where were we at before? I forget to have log generation. All right, central log shipping. My flow is off here. That's what you do, just break my flow. So obviously one of the other requirements by PCI is to get them all to a central place. With that also, it helps us to detect and alert on any kind of anomalies we see. So one of the big things is how do we get these logs to a central place? How do we ship them off? Now for Linux, Mac, network gear, et cetera, you syslog all the things. We all are pretty familiar with syslog, it works great. 
we can send it off to central thing, but is it always the best option just to use our syslog or should we use an agent? Now, I'll touch on that in a second with file integrity monitoring and one of the things we've seen a lot of solutions is to do an open source file integrity monitoring and let that handle your log collection, log forwarding, as well as log processing. These are the cool little tricks we'll talk about more on the site. As well as Windows. Windows event logs suck. Trying to take and get them off into a Linux environment is horrid. The problem is that most things don't handle Windows event processing. So one of the big things is how do we handle that? Now there's two different options that we talk about or we'll post on the site is one, taking and having a Windows event collector and having that as your central syslog push off to your central logging or to do individual agents. Now, as we said earlier, which one should you do? It depends. I hate saying that, but we want to provide as many options as possible for what's going to work for your environment to manage. As well as if you have to deploy file integrity monitoring or other host intrusion detection systems, HIDS, if anyone didn't catch the um, acronym, you might as well use that if you have to deploy that file integrity monitoring to every system. So you get, you're generating logs, you're shipping them off to the mothership. What are we doing with these now? And this is one of the biggest issues we see is that people don't know what to do with the logs once they have them. As well as, as the biggest crucial part when it comes to getting these logs is what's processing and what's storage in. And that's where people turn to a lot of commercial solutions. So that's why we looked and scoured the net long and hard for some of the best open source log server storage and processing systems. These are the five we found that seem to be the best, most flexible, most adaptable, and reliable. That's one of the big things when you get into larger environments, reliable that can process a large thing. Now obviously, you can always just roll your own. PCI says, never says you have to use X solution. You can build your own using just syslog and running grep through syslog to process these logs. I wasn't sure if that was a question, so that's why. I so these are really the five we've seen that are the best. Uh, but which one's right for you? Again, ah, depends. But what we've really seen is that these guys over at FluentD have really put together a great solution. Now it's harder to install, it's harder to build, and we're gonna have the how-to guides posted once I upload all those things. But FluentD is actually, <laughs> what they're building themselves is the open source alternative to Splunk. Again, I love Splunk, no hard feelings, but it's a great solution. Does it work as well? Sure. So <laughs> you have all these logs going to a central storage. Now you actually have to monitor them. Now when PCI says you have to review your logs, there's another interesting caveat people don't realize. You don't have to go through and manually look at every log entry every day. You can actually have automated scanning. So what events do you look for? What events are compliant? Which ones are good for security? And so that will be the other part of our log processing thing is to show what logs you have to monitor, what event IDs in window, what kind of query strings, and that's, as Aaron was saying earlier, the biggest thing we see is people going, all right, I have all these logs, well, what, what, what do you need to demonstrate this, you know? So we'll be looking at what kind of things define anomalies instead of just saying, oh, uh, you should look for anomalies for too many logins. Well, what, what's an anomaly? It depends. Oh. So with the whole talking of logs, another one of the big things I was saying you have to log is obviously file integrity monitoring and looking at to see if there's any, any changes in the systems. So how do you monitor for file integrity? Again, some big commercial solutions have come out and say we can monitor everything in your environment. Now, what we found is that there's actually five, I left one off of here, I apologize, uh, as it's operating sp system specific. There's really five great open source solutions to do this, to be able to monitor, deploy, and check for file integrity monitoring. With all these, the best solution that we found is to take and send this to your central syslog for monitoring and processing. Again, why the two kind of come together. Now, the interesting thing is our favorite so far has been OSSEC. How many people have heard of OSSEC? How many people love it? About a quarter of the hands, ouch. <laughs> we actually love it. We think it's a great thing to be able to have it do initial processing of logs, act as a collector if need be as well, and also monitor file integrity changes. Yes, it's a little more difficult to configure versus say, 
open source tripwire or rolling your own. Uh, but PCI's requirements is interesting. This is where we wanted to come up with and have a place where people could discuss unique ways to address these requirements. PCI's requirements say you need to at least check weekly to see if there's been any file changes. There's nothing that says you have to check every second or live stream or anything like that. It's weekly. So one of the unique uh, situations we've seen is where people have taken and remotely accessed the file share, ran a hash check, a quick MD5 check on all the files that exist, output to file, output to file, diff, is there differences? Yep, generate alert. So there's unique ways we could take and address this using homegrown or open source solutions instead of having to just buy off the product thing. Now granted, monitoring it live is a better security solution, but we can meet that checkbox as well by doing something internally. Patch management is the hardest fucking thing, pardon my English, the hardest thing to address with open source right now. There are not really any great cross-platform open source, and I, in fact, if anyone can know of one, I'd love to hear about it. Anyone? Chef and Puppet is great, but the problem is it's more focused around configuration management though, isn't it? Yeah, true. It does work in many ways. But I've not seen people actually deploy on Windows systems. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. And we've seen a lot of people use it for the Linux environment. So Chef and Puppet, when it comes to open source patch management, are two great solutions combined together. You kind of use them always together uh, for managing the configuration as well as deploying these updates. So Chef and Puppet is where actually the Linux cake was where I was touching on that. So back to where I was starting though with the whole open source thing is what has to be patchable? What do we actually have to monitor? And this is why it's so hard with PCI. You have to patch not just the operating system, but any third party applications as well. So Linux, obviously that's pretty easy. Stick to the stuff in the repo if you can. But Windows, this is where things get difficult. Um, like I said, we, we, were, we had a hard time finding something that was cross-platform that would work and just work in the environment, especially as well as inventorying what software is actually installed. This is where we were talking a lot about what do we want this to be. And so focusing on where you can spend your resources, obviously you only have so much money you can spend if you're working with an organization. This may be somewhere you go, all right, the commercial solutions do better here. I'll spend a little money here versus my logging side where I can save some money so on and so forth. But there are solutions with Windows, like I was saying, you can use WSUS, it's not open source, but it's built into Windows. And there's an open source to tool called WPackage, which will actually do third party packages easier with WSUS than trying to connect to the API manually. Mac, I scoured the world. The only thing I found is Chef and Puppet, you know, and being able to do it through there. But again, this is where also building a homegrown, homegrown situation or uh, solution would help. It's definitely an area where we need more development. And that's one of the big things is we want to take and help build up the security as well, not just the compliance. And so we're, we're, this is our call for help. So if anyone knows of anything, we want to hear from you as well. If, you, if you're bored and you want to start developing a cross-platform patch management solution that's reliable and scalable, there's a summer, winter, fall, two, three year down the line project for you. <laughs> That'll keep you busy and drinking. Uh, two factor authentication is also another thing we see a lot of people get caught up on. So the letter of the law for PCI is that you need to have two factors of three. Something you know, such as a password. Something you have, such as a token, certificate, laptop, account and something you are, biometrics. We really haven't seen people use the biometric side when it comes to logging in remotely. What we have seen mostly is the something you know and something you have. And those are really in the open source world, the two things that could use the most. So as I was saying with the something you know, passwords, everyone uses them. So the second factor is the something you have. Now the PCI letter of the law says this only needs to take place when it's remote connections to the cardholder data environment. So, 
If you can't remote connect into there, you don't need it. But everyone remote connects to their environment. It still exists. So putting some kind of jump box, VPN solution, remote desktop in between there and the cardholder data environment helps get that. So using certificates is obviously, from a PCI perspective, good. From a security perspective, we could lecture on about the security implica implications of if you compromise a machine, getting the certificate, being able to extract that. But meets the checkbox. But we want to go above and beyond that. So looking at other solutions out there, there's not really any SMS-based ones. We see a lot of commercial companies doing it. But what we've actually done for ourselves is we've rolled our own using open, uh, or not open, but using cloud-based telephony services such as Twilio, Plevo. Those are kind of the big ones in the market right now. You can connect to them and just basically say, SMS this phone with this code and use that to build your own. Worked well for us for our SSH management for many of our jump boxes. And it helps work with a one-time thing. How many people here are familiar with OAuth? Not OAuth, OAuth. Very few. So OAuth is the open, oh my gosh, I shouldn't even start with that. Open authentication. No one's finishing me, awesome. Uh, I forget, so it's OAuth is the open authentication project where basically they're focusing on creating an open two-factor authentication using HMAC hashes and truncating them. So it's an open standard, which works great. It's none of this proprietary big three-letter company name. I won't call them out. But a lot of them take and focus on this proprietary stuff, whereas OAuth focus on an open standard. We love it. There's some hardware that you can purchase, or you can also take and do an open so or a software solution. Google Authenticator, for those of you who use the Google Authenticator on your phone, it's OAuth based. What's great about it is you can enroll additional devices, including your jump boxes, your VPNs, et cetera, with having a central authenticator. And that's where it comes into the question marks, is the central authenticator, do you do it radio space or custom plugin based? Excuse me. There's various solutions for that and various based on the business case. Again, it'll be on the site with the different guides for the different radio servers using the YubiKeys, open source one, the Java one, depends on your environment. I need one more water break. Aaron, do you want to talk about antivirus real quick? Sure. Yeah. That's all right, antivirus works, right? It's not dead. See, that, that's the only joke of the day everyone gets is that antivirus is not dead. So yeah, antivirus is a huge struggle with PCI because there's so many environments. I mean, people are running mainframes, they're running custom builds, Linux kernels, and the question is, so why? And, and not only why you're gonna put antivirus on it, it's gonna actually you know, impede the, uh, words are hard today, wow. Thank you, that was a keyword I was looking for, impede the performance of the systems. And a lot of the clients that we've worked with I mean, they're, they're very large scale clients and performance, I mean, this is their lifeblood. So the idea of actually putting any type of antivirus on it just, just frightens them to no end. So what we've done, and I'm not paying any attention to the slides, so I apologize, is, uh, you know, PCI has this, this really cool statement about it, and it is quoted on here, is that deploy antivirus software on all systems commonly affected by malicious software. So, that's a pretty, pretty huge gap in how you interpret that. So, I, I don't know that your custom rolled Linux kernel and the box and apps that you're running on top of it that only your organization has ever seen before is gonna be commonly affected by malware, unless it's targeted malware, I understand. So, this is, well, commonly, commonly. So, some of the solutions that we've, we've seen is, like, like he said, checking for rogue processes. It's more for anomaly detection on those boxes, but most people that are building these boxes and building these systems understand what their system's normal operating you know, standards look like. They understand the processes that are supposed to be running and exactly how they're supposed to be running. One of the great solutions that we've seen, too, is that if there's something wrong, especially in these large-scale environments, is the box just gets re rebooted, it get, not just rebooted, but rewiped. You know, a new config comes down for it, it's completely clean and started all over again. I mean, that tends to work. You want to take back over? You have things to add? 
I apologize. My throat has been really dry for the past week, so I hope I'm not getting sick here. So, yeah. <clears throat> and here, let me pass the mic around. So, again, and the other big thing is antivirus doesn't need to be traditionally signature based. Using application whitelisting, whether it's built, built into Windows or SE Linux, depending upon how you configure it, or App Armor, sometimes meets the requirement. Again, this is where the whole PCI QSA, it depends, always plays into place. But it's an option for you to explore as an open source solution for when you need to take and address this antivirus requirement. Or you can do what everyone does and just install a copy of Clam and call it a day. So, those are kind of the big top issues we see over and over with PCI that can be addressed by open source solutions that don't always need to have a vendor product. Not to say again that vendor products are bad, but so when you go back to your organization, your, your client's organizations, or someone you may stumble in in the future, friend who may be like, hey dude, how do I handle this? You'll have some ideas. As well as, like I said, a lot more will be developing on the whole Open PCI project site. We'll have a way for everyone to discuss, kind of saying, hey, I did this, this worked out well. What do you guys think, slash manageability, slash all the other fun stuff. So, that's kind of the big issues we see over and over. However, there are a few random PCI fun issues we see. Um, and yes, I got lazy and just threw these all into one slide. That's what happens at 3 a.m. So one of the big things we see is, you know, PCI has a requirement saying that shared passwords can't be used across users. That means you cannot have a shared administrative password on multiple machines. However, PCI says you can have a service account with a shared password as long as it's not a shared knowledge password. Again, talk to your QSA a little bit more about it, but what we see as solutions for this, because everyone gets dinged on this, is that they are like, oh yeah, I've got a local admin account for all these machines. I mean, what if the machine goes offline? I can't trust that it can connect to Radius or Active Directory or whatever. I gotta be able to log in that box and my IT guys have to be able to fix it. <sighs> Turns out that's what QSAs love to go, ha ha, you're not compliant. I have a finding, I'm an auditor, I got a finding. Yes, my boss is gonna give me, Assessor, sorry. Assessor? This is why I'm not a QSA yet. So, I just, I just, I just took the test. Uh, yeah, it'll be fun. So, one of the things we've seen a lot with people is that they've either done one of two things. One is to take and use either an envelope, and I'm not kidding you, putting the, having one admin write the password down, put it in an envelope, and put it in a, seal it, and put it in a safe, and so if they need it, they can go and get it. And if they get it, they have to change all the passwords. Uh, and do the, yeah. this is one of those requirements. You, this is one of the things you face palm at, and you're like, really, I have to do this to be compliant? And I've talked to QSAs who have recommended this, and I'm like, this is what we're recommending now? Like, write your password down and put it in a safe, and only one guy can know this? One of the other things we've seen that worked well, though, that we've recommended personally, is other than doing just unique local admin accounts and using solutions to change all the passwords, is um, how many people are familiar with Yubico and YubiKeys? They're pretty cool. Um, as much as they're not open source, this is again like the fun gotchas, they can do single passwords. So if you have someone program a password in there for the one time press, that technically is compliant because you don't know the password when you push the keystroke to do it. Because YubiKeys can do just not two factor but also stored passwords as well. So something interesting we kind of put in there as a little gotcha that we wanted to take and throw in there. Um, do you want to get the rest? Yeah. Giving you a break. So some of the other fun ones, and we've all seen by track changes, I'm assuming, 3 a.m. Zach meant change control and all that good stuff. All that rolled into one fun little thing in the reviews. So, I mean, change control, we all know what it is. We all know how annoying it is in some certain applications. Developers are generally a lot better at doing it than normal system admins, and so it's just a normal gotcha. One of the other items, and we haven't added it up here yet as far as the solution. There are a few really cool open source solutions that are coming out that do change control if you're at a small organization, small to mid-size, which is nice, because you don't need these huge management systems. And again, you can roll your own. 
One of the items I wanted to address about rolling your own and having your own resources, in this room, I, I just feel the intelligence overwhelmed. But we would all know that we probably all go back and work with people that might be of a little less intelligence than we are or have those people on our team. This is one of the reasons and drivers why we wanted to do this in the first place is because we wanted to allow people to have the budget to actually get good technical resources. Now, rolling your own isn't always reasonable if rolling your own means that a technical resource is gonna be doing nothing but coding this for freaking two months. That helps nobody. So again, your mileage will vary, but you know, apply the resources where they can. This is one of the things that was intended to do. One of the other items, and we all, I cringe at this, is the segregation of roles. In large organizations, segregation of roles is a little bit easier, but when you start talking mid-sized organizations and small businesses that have to comply with PCI, I mean, it's a nightmare. It's not even realistic half the time. So getting really creative is one of the things that we, we work on doing, we work on educating, and we work with a lot of other QSAs that have nothing to do with us to collaborate and understand good solutions for being able to do that segmentation. And again, I, I almost uh, almost hit myself in the head with the one primary function per system. Again, in enterprise environments and environments that are scaled and built for these applications, it's fine. But when you're talking, again, small businesses or mid-sized businesses that are just, they're struggling to actually keep their scope as small as they can. But yet, you know, they don't have the money for a lot of hardware. So they're trying to get very, very creative with it. A lot of times it's not always applicable. The managing of crypto keys. Uh, no one's doing this well. I, I, I mean, I'm serious. If you guys think, if, if, if any of you can honestly admit that your, your company is managing your, your keys extremely well, especially your SSL keys, go ahead, raise your hand. I, yeah, may, maybe, maybe, but that's a bold statement. Okay, okay, well, can we go on the record for that? Okay. And you actually, you're, you might have the only fighting chance I might believe, too. Maybe. Oh, do you want to? Oh, you can't. No, I, I won't bash a certain company. No. Um, no, and so that's one of the big things we've seen is that um, putting the SSL keys technically, again, this is one of the things QSAs will go gotcha on, is that um, you have to protect even the SSL key because it's the data in transit. Now, granted, your site for domain.tld, you're probably doing your credit card processing if you're doing it externally, you know, not just phone, but you know, online e-commerce stuff, we've seen a lot, is people will take and not protect that key. They'll just be like, oh, well, if the server reboots, it needs to be able to unlock the SSL key. That's fine, right? Nope. As well as, you know, technically, BCI says that not one person can have knowledge of that key or its full thing. So you actually have to control that key's encryption. Uh, that's another fun one. That's another word, you know, like I said, YubiKey is not a endorse solution, but it works great for having a stored password and be like, boop, okay, done. Um, I, I think we're, we're almost out of time, though. Is that's why I was trying to wrap that up. I know. I just, I just wanted to get to the last, the last question and answer. So again, in, in kind of summarizing what we've, we've gone through. <laughs> oh, he brought it up. So yes, again, we are not your QSA. We will be more than happy to do question and answers, but please don't be offended if there's certain items that we're not going to be able to talk about since it's going to be a recorded session. We have no problem that certain QSAs might be at the bar later. But in the words of the great Mike Don, who trained, for, who trained a lot of QSAs, his, his signature answer to everything is, it depends. So again, your mileage may vary. We're not your QSA. Zach wants to talk to you again. I swear it's the last thing I have before questions. Um, but again, like I said, you know, the big thing we want to push and the thing we want to push with this open PCI project is that there's open source solutions that we can start utilizing as a community for our clients, for our environments that we can start using and customizing a lot more to not just improve our compliance, but let's go above and beyond that and improve the security as well. And use, obviously, since PCI is a driver for a lot of businesses, we can use that to get a little resource, a little time to start saying, hey, I want to work on this. You know, I, it's for PCI, right? You know, we got this big thing that we got to build to it. So using that as a driving force to take and actually improve the security using these kind of open source solutions to go above and beyond. Cool?
And it's not just us. If you guys want to help out or have time to help out in the Open PCI project, by all means, please reach out to us. We need as much help as possible from the community. He needs one more thing. And now we're opening it for questions. <laughs> so we do have a roaming mic. Sir talks a lot. Hi, so uh, two quick questions. Yes. Um, the first one is, if your logging system inadvertently logs current holder data, does it then become within the scope of PCI DSS? Which then leads me to my second question. You've talked a lot about technical controls, and that's what the title of your talk was, but I'd love to hear a bit more about how many assessments succeed or fail based on the game of poker of scoping. Like what is and what is not in scope? How do you exclude stuff? I've had to go through this, it was painful. Um, Talk a bit more about that, thanks. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk right now uh, first about the logging. So PCI, yeah, it actually has a requirement there for checking to see if there's cardholder data stored in logs and what kind of cardholder data is stored in there. Now, it allows you to technically have cardholder data for debugging purposes, including authentication data before authorization, as long as it's securely erased. But one of the things is, yes, those kind of systems do come into scope. And that's where you know we talked about store processes, transmits, directly connected to, and manages. So if all of a sudden that logging system or, say, the other system that manages the logging system started getting cardholder data being sent to it, it would then be under scope. And this is something I, I feel that I can say openly. And just as my piece of advice from being an internal, working internally and getting assessed, is that one thing a lot of organizations don't think of doing, and this is upon any type of change in your environment as well. If you are working with a QSA or QSAC company, ask them to do a limited scope only assessment of your company if you can, if, if you have the bandwidth to be able to do that. So have the QSA come in and address what your scope actually is before you're in the process of a rock assessment and then you're sitting there for three days, you know, just fighting over what, where the boundaries are of your scope. I mean, that, as we all know, scope tends to be a huge challenge. And if you don't believe that that QSA is right, ask for another opinion. And I, I don't like endorsing it because you know, we both come from a QSA company, but you know, in my prior life, I had no problem kicking an assessor off, off site. You know, if I didn't believe what they were saying, I now, that's only if I thought they were not competent, not just because they weren't telling me what I wanted to hear. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Excellent. Any other questions? It's, it's, it's a fun topic. All right, so we'll be around for a little bit to answer any questions you may not have wanted to ask in open public. We'll be just outside. We'll be outside. Uh, we'll linger around here for a few seconds, too. Feel free, like I said, if you have any questions about PCI, how it impacts your environment, how you want to help out with the project, please let us know. And otherwise, thanks for all listening to us ramble, and uh, have a good lunch. Cheers. Thank you.